Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Josiah Ronco. Josiah Ronco worked in the live music industry for 18 years. He first delved into real estate in 2012, exploring long-term and short-term rental properties. His interest in land flipping emerged in 2018. Following a temporary layoff from his job due to COVID in 2020, Josiah decided to pivot his career. He is now completely dedicated to and fascinated by this business. Josiah leads a team of four people operating across Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Josiah, thanks so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Awesome. <laughs> Super excited to have you on. You have such a colorful background. I can't wait to hear <laughs> how you wound up in the land space. So let's jump right in. How did you get started in doing land deals? Ari Tipster and Seth, I heard him on Bigger Pockets. And was intrigued and then started just consuming his podcast and anything else I could find. And I was planning to start land flipping at some point while I was still doing my day job because I realized it was something I could easily do while I was on tour. And then COVID hit, I got laid off and then I just decided to go all in from there. Yeah, I love that. So you mentioned tour. Give us a little bit of background about what you did in your past life before uh, you got into land. So I was the, the layman's term for what I did was a roadie. I was a guitar and keyboard technician primarily worked in the tour. I started in the live music industry like 2003. I started touring in 2006 and basically I was just travel around with different artists and bands and set up their equipment and make sure it worked and maintain it and clean it. And, you know, basically everything from unpacking the truck to packing up the truck at the end of the night and traveling all over the world and it was a very fun job it got old over time just being gone all the time being away from my wife all the time and family and missing stuff and no routine but it was a very cool job for the time that I did it but uh, yeah that's amazing can you give us a little give us a, a short list of who are some of the, the groups that you worked with the most famous groups I worked for probably One Republic Paramore, New Kids on the Block, Borellis. And then I worked for a bunch. I came up, I got into the industry working with some indie rock and like heavy metal bands from Florida. I worked for this band called Under Oath for a long time, which they're still a band. I'm still actually I was just camping with some of them this weekend. We're still we still hang out and stuff. They're from Tampa. Love but it. I started in that and then slowly moved into more like pop, the pop music, like the pop scene. But uh, yeah, those would be the most famous. One Republic's the most, everybody's heard. Even if you don't know who One Republic is, probably at least 10 of their songs. Got uh, it. Just from being in a Whole If you were in, been in a Whole Foods or a Home Depot or a hotel lobby, <laughs> One Republic songs. <laughs> I love it. My background is in music as well. And okay. I, yeah, so I, I used to be a high school band director and I still do consult and judge band competitions and things That's like awesome. that. And anytime I get to connect with another musician and or someone that is from the, the music industry, it's so cool. So I could talk about that forever. That's another podcast, I think, <laughs> uh, another yeah. episode. But let's talk to me about what was that very first deal like for you when you got into land flipping? <laughs> my, my first deal was like the first one like that I actually sold or the first one yeah. that I bought. Let's do the first, like your very first, like the very first deal that you ever touched that you went from just learning and now like actually doing something with the very first deal that I touched was like this. I didn't know at the time, but it was landlocked. It was like five acres. It was in Lake County, Florida. If anybody knows the area, I can't remember the name of, I don't even know if it's a subdivision, but it's just like, a, there's, it's near this area called the green swamp. I'm sure people listening to this have flipped parcels around this area but i thought it had access because it had a dirt road running through it it did not have legal access i learned <laughs> later but i bought it for so cheap uh, and luckily all the comps i was looking at were also landlocked so i think that's what protected me from not losing money on that and that was like a buy for I think I bought that for three and sold it for six or something like that. I can't remember. So it was like, it was enough that I was like, oh man, that's like, now I wouldn't even do a deal like that. But it's then it was like, oh shit, this is real. This actually this works. works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. And so how did you learn when you first got started? You mentioned that you had consumed a lot of podcasts and Seth, Seth Williams, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Love Seth's stuff for sure. He's the best. Uh, 
did you have any mentors or coaches or courses or anything like that that you that you went through? The first course I went through was the RE Tipster course. And then I and I followed that like basically to pretty much to the letter. I stuck to that for the first year. And then after that, I did I did Land Academy for a while. I'm still a Land Academy member now. And then from then it's Callan Faulkner. I'm still in her mastermind. She's been a coach of mine. She was actually the first person to beat it into my head that I needed to start hiring people because I was too busy. Yeah. Um, Callan is the queen of systems. Like I am such a Callan Faulkner fan. It is unbelievable. (laughs) She's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. Yeah. I'm so glad that I've listened to her on multiple occasions. Um, yeah, yeah she's, so- she's incredible. She's <laughs> just remarkable. Great friend of mine. Yeah, I, I, I'm right with you there. So yeah. Uh, all right. So you got you had a, a like a little sampling of from different people yeah. and everything. So yeah. you mentioned that you bought this first deal at something like three k. Essentially doubled your money. Now yeah. you have proof of concept. Yeah. What was your next deal? So after you figured out, okay, this stuff works. What yeah. was the next? What was the next deal like for you? Also landlocked. <laughs> Um, (laughs) you're like hey if it ain't broke (laughs) it ain't broke like just do it (laughs) also landlocked knew it was landlocked understood what that meant now but just based on i won't go into a bunch of detail but we just uh well i'll go into as much detail as you want but it was landlocked but just looking at the way it had been cut out of another parcel i was like this is a slam dunk case to sue for access so i bought it And then the guy who I was going to, I wasn't just going to come out and sue them. I was going to send a letter, pay for access, offer that to start. The guy I was going to reach out to that was landlocking me in literally reached out to me. It was just completely serendipity or whatever. I don't know what the word is, but 10 days after I closed on it, he called me and was like, Hey, would you be interested in selling this property? And so I ended up selling it to him for like, about quadruple what I paid for it. And that was a bigger profit. I think that one was more like 15 or 16 K. And that was like, I was floored because as a touring guitar tech, I was at the top of the industry. So it, maybe not the very, t- I was in the top probably 1% of like roadies or whatever. And it's, you don't make nearly that much money. You, you got to be on tour for like more than a month to make that kind of money gone for a solid month. And I'm like, I just made this off one deal. So I was, then I was extra four. I was, if I wasn't all in before, I was really all in after that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So now you're hooked. You're yes. like, okay, not only does this work, but I can make some serious money doing this. Yeah. So talk to us about what you, like, what kind of land deals do you specialize in now? So what do you, what's your bread and butter in your business model now? We're almost, we are marketing in Georgia and Alabama, but we're almost, we're like 98% in Florida. I don't know what our, I feel like I, I haven't been the best historically at like KPIs and tracking things, but I would say that our bread and butter is probably like rural 10 acre lots in Florida with some variation in that. Maybe it's five to 20 acres is the range, but usually rural, usually on a dirt road, or maybe just an easement for access or maybe no access. That's, that's probably our bread and butter deal. Like, but then we do a lot of, it seems like now we do maybe every month or two, we do a really big deal. And that could be a couple hundred acres. Actually, we have four properties that are all about 120 acres in our inventory right now, which I guess is it's a common size. You see a lot of 120 acre more or less parcels that have just, that's just how they got cut up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And are you still actually just like buying and, and closing and then turning around and flipping? Is that still your business model? Or are you doing any type of like creative deal structuring or financing or anything like that? For the most part, we're just buying it. We are starting to do, thanks to Ajay, we're starting to do more double closes. We actually just got one under contract literally today, like a double close deal in Georgia. So we're starting to pursue those more when we can't get it at a cash price that we're comfortable with. And then I guess we're starting to, we just bought our first one with on owner financing like a hard short-term hard money, like a one-year hard money loan the owner gave us. 
And then we're starting to do more. We have a couple probate deals mm. in our pipeline right now. Those have been complicated. Probably not the best return on our time, but I really like doing them because they're fun and they're interesting. And those really feel more so than a lot of our other deals. They really feel like, wow, we're really like, we're really helping people here. Like they have no idea what to do and we're willing to get our heads in there and solve the puzzle. Very um, cool. Probate attorney. Yeah. Very cool. So let's dive into that for a minute. If someone is listening to this and they're not really familiar with probate deals, can you walk us through what that looks like? Walk us through a typical deal that you've done? I'm definitely not. I'm far from even being like a novice at this, but our rules so far, if we take on a probate deal is we have to have at least one person, one heir that's easy to talk to on the phone. They have to be, we have to be able to understand them. I know that might sound, I don't, I don't know how often we get these people that call us and it's like, they don't, they have a horrible phone or something with a terrible connection. <laughs> Every time you're on the phone with them, or they have such a thick, especially being in the South that we talk to people that they have such a thick accent. Like I cannot, we just can't understand what they're saying. And so wow. that's like a rule. We have to understand them and they have to seem motivated to like help us get it done. So we have to have at least one representative who it's like, they can, they know how to use email. They know how to use a smartphone. They can wrangle the rest of the family members that are involved. That's like the main thing for us yeah. that, that we want to see to take it on. Got um, it. So let's say someone's listening to this and they are very used to the the model that you started with, where you buy for, buy at a discount, you sell with a markup. That's how they make their spread. And they're just now hearing about probate deals. What is a probate deal and how can they go about finding them, working them? Just talk us through your experience with how you got into probate deals. So we're, we're not targeting them specifically. We just, if they come in, we do a lot of other people. We just do shotgun approach. We just mail the whole county. You're going to get a lot of leads from probate deals. The old, I've been paying the taxes on it for 20 years. That means I own it. Unfortunately, no. So we get a lot of those leads without trying to target them. And really it's just where one of the, one or all of the owners is dead. And you have to sort that out through the courts is basically the, and it doesn't matter if they had a will, even if they had a will, you still got to go. People think that all the time too, right? Oh, they have a will in Florida. You still have to go through probate. Even if you have a will, it doesn't matter. We're doing one right now that we had to do. We're buying four properties that are all contiguous or adjacent. And we were doing, I think I can't remember. I'm losing track now. We were doing two or three probates to clean all this up. And then one of the sellers died like a month ago. So we were oh, like no. almost to the finish line. And then one of the sellers died. So now we're doing another probate. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So in your experience, are those deals, like what are the margins like for some of the deals that you've done? They've been similar to other flips. I, that's why I say it's probably not the best return on time. I think if you don't have a heart for doing it, you probably shouldn't. I don't know. For us, the margins are similar to just doing a straight flip. So it. it's a lot more work than a straight flip. But like I said, it for me, it's like a game. It's like a puzzle. I don't know. Can we figure this out? So I, I like it. I'm inspired. I don't know if, are you familiar with that guy, Uncle Carl? Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm inspired. I don't know him, but like I've watched a bunch of his stuff on YouTube. Like that's, ins we're not anywhere. We're nowhere even close to like his level of like messy deal cleanup, but that is inspiring to me. I just think that stuff is really cool. If you yeah. take a property that the, the title's all messed up and you can clean that up and make it good again, I just think that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. And I would imagine that you have slightly less competition because it's a problem, right? Yeah. A lot of people are not willing or they don't have the tools or the, the patience to say, let me fix these title issues. And that might be a niche in of itself. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. So can you talk to us about, let's get into some nuts and bolts of your business. So how do you go about picking a target market in your given areas? In Florida, we don't really, we just mail everything because we just know 
not literally every county. Like we don't really mail like heavily populated counties because that's just not our thing. But as far as rural counties in Florida, we're just constantly cycling through mailing all of them because we know them all. We can comp properties pretty quickly and easily there. And it's we have in most of the state, it's we have a surveyor, an environmental person, an agent in most of the markets we mail anyways. But, but yeah, we don't really have there's no market selection process Just say, in Florida. We're, we're doing it. We're, we're yeah. rolling. Yeah. So what's your approach when you get into newer markets? Because you, it sounds like Florida, that's your expertise lies in, in that particular market. But you also mentioned that you guys are have had a foray into Georgia and Alabama. Yeah. Uh, when you decided to go into those new markets, what were some of the things that you looked for in order to say, okay, these might be some counties that we want to explore? We started mailing just over the border into in Georgia and Alabama because some of our vendors work on both mm. sides of the border. So okay. it was an easy, it was just, oh, we're just mailing the next two counties north. As far as when we've gone further north into the States, we're using land insights right now to do research. That's how we've been picking our county. If, if we're mailing a county that's out of our range in Georgia or Alabama, we're using land insights. Awesome. Tell us a little bit more about that. What What is Land Insights and what what can you do with it? Our, our director of marketing could talk about it more than me, but it's, I believe it, it's Sumner Healy. I yep. don't know how to pronounce his name. Sumner and Rylan. It's their tool and it's basically, it's like a Tableau spreadsheet on steroids. I think they're about to move it off of Tableau though for version two, but it's just a great tool for looking at sell-through rates and whether prices which direction prices are trending and how much inventory is on the market in specific acreage ranges. Yeah, it's been, it's very cool. Yeah, we've been really enjoying, I mean, I haven't played around with it as much, but Ginny has been using it a lot to select new counties and everything. So, yeah. Excellent. Very good. So let's talk a little bit about your criteria for deals. So let's say now that, now that you have figured out which markets you're going to target, what's your criteria for deals? Do you have a particular size range? Do you have a, a value range? What are, what's that criteria like? It's probably, typically we're mailing anything over an acre. And usually we don't want to mess with it if it's, we don't really target anything that's less than maybe 10 or 12 grand in market value. I'd say somewhere in there, but there's no limit on it. We'll go, we mail everything. Our biggest acquisition to date, I think was like a million bucks. And that was like 700 acres. So we'll go, there's no cap for us. Um, yeah, we can get the money if we don't have it. So awesome. Yeah. So how do you go about raising capital for those kinds of deals? Funders, lines of credit, local credit unions, hard money lender. We have two hard money lenders we're working with now. It could be a mix cash. Our own cash is the easiest, right? That's preferred. But for, for some of the bigger ones, it's like not prudent to put that much cash into one deal. So we'll get a funder or multiple funders. It just depends. We have a couple friends and family that are putting money into deals, which is nice. And they're like, they've done a couple, most of them have done at least two or three deals successfully now. So they're hooked just like I got hooked. So yeah. they're like, all right, when's the next one? Yeah. That's awesome. So when you're working with friends and family to fund some of your deals, what are some of the tips or best practices that you can share with us in terms of like, how do you go about doing that? And how? what are the returns like for your friends and family investors, things like that? Best practices? I think just having a lot of respect for their money. Like you should probably have, I'm more scared. If I lose my own money on a deal within reason, I not to say I don't give a shit, but like I do. But the idea of losing a friend or family member's number, not money, or even just even like the two hard money lenders that we work with are have become friends now from doing business with them. That sounds awful. Like that just sounds like the worst <laughs> thing yeah. ever. So I don't know. I think like you should feel that way. If you don't feel that way, you might be a sociopath. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. get that. Totally get that. Yeah. So. What types of returns are they seeing on a typical deal or just even, it doesn't have to be a typical deal. It could just be one that comes to mind. 
the annualized returns could be anywhere between 20 i think the lowest has been like a 12 percent annualized return and the highest was like some stupid number like sixty thousand percent because wow because it was like it flipped in 10 days you know so when you annualize that um, sure in terms of like actual roi it's probably they're probably ranging between 10 and 10 and 30 or 40 percent roi depending on the oh, deal uh, nice yeah awesome so let's jump back into how you go about getting your deals you mentioned mail several times what are some of your are you only mailing or what other marketing channels are you using right now we are currently we're only mail and then we get we do get a decent amount of deals just from we, we fund a decent amount of deals just from word of mouth through land academy discord other discord channels facebook meet somebody at a conference that kind of thing yeah uh, so we do it but as far as our like actual marketing it's all direct mail right now awesome and do you yeah. know like how many deals per how many mail pieces are you getting right now i think it's around last year i want to say it was around one for three thousand or something like that oh i think so I'm not the right. I'm not the KPI guy, so that's all right. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> kind of that's guessing. okay. Yeah. Do you know about how many mail pieces you guys are actually sending out a month? This year, I think it's like around sixteen thousand a month currently, something like that. Sixteen, seventeen thousand. Awesome. And yeah. what mail house are you guys using right now? We just do it right through Pebble currently. Mm -hmm. We use Pebble public. and it's so easy. I'm sure yeah. we could probably do it a little cheaper or other places, but it's easy to just mail it straight from Pebble and do the drip campaign. I I'm like drip fan too. What's yeah. that? So I'm a Pebble fan too. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. use Pebble in my business and yeah, definitely recommend I love those guys. Yeah. I love oh my those gosh. Guys. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned drip. Can you talk a little bit about your, your cadence for mailing? Are you retargeting some of these people if they don't respond or is it just, you also mentioned shotgun. So what is your, <laughs> what's your approach to, to mailing your lists, man, right now it's just whatever we feel like there's not like, <laughs> it's not, it's, there's nothing like sophisticated about it. I think we're getting to that, especially like Jenny's been like stepping up more into this chief marketing officer, whatever you want to call it role. And so I think eventually we'll probably have more of a defined cadence but right now it's just, it's probably, we're probably not remailing. Mo I don't know. There actually, I think there's been times where we've remailed like two or three months later. Okay. I don't know if, but I don't know if those have been successful or not. Um, gotcha. But I think a lot of times it's probably more like every six months, six, seven months. I feel like that we're remailing. Okay. I'm not sure. That's the beautiful thing about the land business. Like you just, it doesn't have to be like super complex and super complicated for you to be able to get results, right? Yeah. So I love that so much about it. And talking about, before we get off of marketing, speaking yeah. about lead generation really quick. So where are you pulling your lists from? What's your data source? Right now it's Land Vision. Land Vision. But we've used Data Tree. We just haven't been using Data Tree the last few months, but so both of those. Excellent. Yeah. And Whenever you are, are you sending out neutral letters? Are you sending out blind offers? What does that look like? Both, but mostly blind offers. Okay. Yeah. And I definitely, that doesn't surprise me because you are like, you've decided and, and started digging deep in the Florida market. So it's probably yeah. a lot easier for you to be able to comp all of that. But what does your comping yeah. process look like when you're pricing your blind offers? Hey there, land fans. If you're enjoying this episode and would like to see more episodes like this, please be sure to let us know by liking and subscribing below. I don't know what it looks like right now because <laughs> I don't That's do okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Then that brings me to my next question. Tell me what your team looks like. <laughs> so I've got, we have a uh, Cheyenne who is our like purchasing manager, acquisitions manager, and she is also, she would be, I, get, I I learned this recently that a lot of people have what they call a leads manager. So she is also like the leads manager. And then she and I both handle like transaction coordinator type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
And then Ginny is marketing officer, I would say, director of marketing, something like that. So she's doing data, mailers, she comps, she does 99% of the comping. When we're, when we have leads come in, she's the one comping the leads. And then we, we're doing a lot of other stuff. We're implementing, we started implementing traction and EOS yeah. yes. this year, which is huge been EOS awesome. Fan. Yeah. It's been great, man. We hired like a implementer or coach, whatever, and he's been great. And so, so everybody's already... been stepping up. Got uh, it. To, Got to, it. To, we all have rocks and like everybody's brand, like Cheyenne is doing things that aren't like she's creating SOP documents that don't really have much to do with like her specific role. Cause she's just, everybody is in this like leadership position now sure, sure. because of yeah. EOS, which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So yeah. I think I already know the answer to this question, but since you mentioned EOS, are you yeah. a visionary? Or are you an integrator? Apparently I'm like a classic visionary, which makes sense. <laughs> it would make sense yes. if you saw what my, uh, what my OmniFocus and my Basecamp accounts look like. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Just <laughs> lots of ideas, too many ideas to ever be executed on. That's okay. That's okay. Because yeah. one day they will be one day. Yes. They will be right. Yes. I love it. So what about you? Oh, I am a textbook visionary, okay. like to a nice. fault. To a nice. fault. Yeah. Ajay and I, we, yeah, we were talking about that. It's one of our, one of our favorite topics to talk about is nice. how visionary we are <laughs> and, and all of that. Do you think that you have some, do you think you have a certain percentage of integrator in you or, cause for yeah. me, I feel like yeah. I have, I think when I, the last time I took the test, it had me at 70, 30 and there are, yeah. I really, I do enjoy like executing on tasks and like getting shit done. So I don't, I'm, I was curious what you think. Yeah. So I'm probably like 80, 20. Like I, I can really get in, roll up the sleeves and do the nuts and bolts thing, but that is totally not my lane. Like I would much rather be like coming up with the ideas, the vision, how can I support the the nuts and the bolts? But yeah. when I get too much in the weeds for too long, I'm like, oh gosh, oh my God, I can't, I just can't. I'm like, please <laughs> just let's just do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to know if the sausage is made. Let's just do it. Yeah. I definitely get you though, man. I definitely feel that. That's cool. So. Talk to me a little bit about what are some of your main deal breakers? So as you mentioned that sometimes you've got some neutral letters. And so what are your deal breakers when those leads start coming in? To be honest, there's almost no, there's almost no property. There's some exceptions, but there's almost no property that we won't buy if the price, it, there's always a price. And usually it bottoms out. There's almost any, I will buy almost any property for 500 bucks. There's, there are some exceptions to that. We actually just bought one. It's landlocked. It has a conservation ease, which I think encompasses a good portion of it. And it is, but the reason we bought it, it's pretty swampy too, but the reason we bought it is that it's it's up for, in the next 10 years, it's in the path of eminent domain for a highway. Uh -huh. And basically like we talked to the attorney, talked to some trusted advisors and we bought this thing for next to nothing. And if the imminent domain thing kicks in, we'll make a fortune off of it. Yeah. That's, but it's that's completely really speculative. Cool. It's completely speculative. Yeah. Like it could be nothing. It could be the, the imminent domain, the highway expansion. It might never happen. But to me, it's, it's worth the, for, I think we paid like a grand for it or something like, it's, oh yeah, dude, just, just forget about it. Maybe in 10 years, 20 years, we get like a big check for that. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So how did you guys find out that it was in the path of eminent domain? The seller told us. Okay. And he was older. He was cleaning up affairs. He just wanted to like, I think he saw it as like a liability. Maybe he Got just it. didn't, he didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, a sure. he's one of these people, very savvy real estate developer from the panhandle, but just, he had no... He's in his eighties and he's just trying to like divest and sure. Yeah. Very cool. Now your first two deals sound make, I, I think that listening to how you uh, did those first two deals, it doesn't surprise me that you're not scared of landlocked properties. A lot of people that I talk to, they're like, oh, if it's landlocked, they don't even touch it. I just throw it out. We actually screen scrub all of that stuff out, but it sounds like you're like landlocked. Yeah, it's not a problem. So talk to me yeah. about What's your approach to dealing with landlocked properties and how can you make them work in your current business model? It's usually just, if we can buy them really cheap, 
is really like what it comes down. It's got to be for us. I think there's people that are probably savvier in specific areas of, oh, I know the code to like get anything to be not landlocked in these four counties. We're not mm. at that level of knowledge. For us, it's just like, if we can buy it cheap enough, then we'll do it. Got it. And do you have a rule of thumb for what's cheap enough? You mentioned 500 bucks, but do you have a rule of thumb for what is cheap enough? It would depend on the property. It depends on how many, it depends on how many parcels are landlocking us in. Like in that case that I told you, the second deal I did, it was basically, it was one, there was one like perfectly rectangular 50 acre parcel with the road frontage. And our five acres was like, just, I think the way our five acres got carved out, it was in the South West corner with no road frontage. And it, it got carved out that way because of like a, what's it called? I think it's intestate succession. Like there was a, a death with no will. And it was just a court. It was just like court appointed that way. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the 1940s or something. And they didn't wow. do, they didn't do an easement or anything like that. Or it might've even been before the four. I don't, it went back a long ways from when that split happened. And they didn't do an easement. And so in that case, we knew it's, this is a slam dunk case to get an easement down the side of that now 45 acres or whatever it was. But there's other landlocked parcels where you would have to get easements across 10 other parcels. Right. And that's right. just, that's gotta be <laughs> truthfully a lot of stuff like that. We just pass on that because it's just not whatever, or we'll make a really low offer. And people usually just say no, almost all the time they say no, because it's such a low offer. Sure. We don't really want it. I don't really want it, but it's if you really want to get rid of it. Got it. Got it. You know? Yeah. It has to be like firehouse sale kind yes. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes total sense. Whenever you are looking at, let's say you're looking at a potential candidate for a landlocked property comes along and there may be only one property that's blocking it from having road access. Do you actually do any type of due diligence around the probability of getting road access to it before you get it under contract or before you buy it? Or do you just buy it and pray or like, what's the, <laughs> what's the plan? I'd say the main thing we look at is I think, I guess you got to be careful about this anywhere. Like in Florida, if you think, you know, where the path of an easement would go, you need to make sure that legal access would be physically usable. If you're cutting over a swamp, that's got three feet of water most of the year. It's great. You have legal access, but how are you going to, how are you going to actually use that legal access? It's, you might as well be landlocked. So I think that's probably something we look for. Like in that case, that example I was talking about before I went to the property and walked it and it was dry. I knew it was dry. There was no wetlands. It was high and dry. And the terrain was Florida. You don't really have to think about topography, at least not in the in the panhandle, you got to think about topography for sure. We've seen some crazy gullies and slopes and stuff in the panhandle, but in this property was in Marion County near Ocala. Mm. It's very, it's pretty flat there. You get some rolling hills, but there's no like uncrossable. I'm pretty sure there's no uncrossable topography in Marion County. I could be wrong, but. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Okay. So let's talk dispo for a minute. So what types of dispo strategies do you use for your properties? Are you just listing them up with a realtor or how do you go about marketing to find buyers? We pretty much exclusively list with realtors. We've done the occasional, we have a tiny buyers list that we've flipped a couple contracts to. We actually did just recently, we sold a property on Facebook marketplace. I don't even know why. I, I can't remember why we even did that. It was just, I might've just been bored. I don't know. I wrote the <laughs> listing description with chat GPT and just yeah. threw it up there. And we sold, but the, that was the first time we'd sold a property without an agent in two years. Um, yeah, I think I mean, we just, I think we just couldn't find an agent in the area or something. I don't remember why, but. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any, any specific tips on what's the best way to find the best land agents in a given market? Now it's all, I feel like now for us, it's been like word of mouth. When we started, it's like nothing special. Just I'm looking for probably what any other guru would tell you. It's look for people that have listings that look nice. Do they answer their phone? For me, a big one, 
I don't know if I've heard other, I don't know if I've heard like gurus talk about this, but for me, this is very important. Like I want to enjoy talking with them on the mm. phone. I want yeah. to enjoy working with them. Cause as you as I'm a talker and we're going to, if we're going to be doing a lot of business together, it's like, we're going to be on the phone a lot. We're probably going to be like hanging out, meeting up in the field. And there's been a handful of agents that in the past we've used. And it's, I realized like, oh, I don't, oh, when this person calls, I like, don't want to talk to them. And, and I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't work with them anymore if I don't want to <laughs> talk with them. And so now it's every agent we work with. I love talking. Sometimes I'm like too busy to talk on the phone or whatever. It's easier to text, but everybody that we work with now is awesome. I would have a beer with any of them and have on some occasions. But yeah, there's nothing special, right? It's just look for people. If the listing looks like shit, your listing's going to look like shit. If they don't answer the phone, if you're having a hard time getting a hold of them, buyers are going to have a hard time getting a hold of them. It's yep. pretty simple, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you have a team of like a title company, things like that in your market. Can you dive in a little bit deeper and tell us like which vendors are on your team, which, what roles do they play? That kind of thing. We have a title, they have a title company in Florida, kind of three that we work with, but one that we do almost all of our business with. We have like a, we have a surveyor in every sort of like region. Cause I've, I don't, I've found even recently we we're getting, we're doing this deal Sorry, I'm jumping off of your question a little bit here, but oh, we, we're doing this deal. We bought this property that has three right-of-ways that dead end into our parcel. So it's imagine like a, a comb, like a hair comb or whatever. So it's got these mm -hmm. three right-of-ways, right? And so we're vacating those right-of-ways. We're going through the process of having them vacated. So we'll have a nice rectangle parcel and also have, it'll take it from being like, 20 acres to five acres or something like that. We'll get back, something like that. And okay. as we're in the final stage of that process, we have approval from the neighbors. We have approval from the county. We have to get a legal description and a survey for each one of those right, of each one of those three sections of right away that's being vacated. I talked to two surveyors that I've worked with before who are awesome. And they both, their price was crazy it was like 12 grand and they were like we're sorry that it's this much it's just it's out of our range we've never done any surveys in that area like so it's just going to be i don't know all the terminology but based that just creates a lot more potential headache for them they don't really know what they're getting into i got a hold of like a local surveyor who's 30 minutes away and has done a ton of surveyors in that exact like zip code and their price was like like a quarter of that. It was like under three grand. It was less than a quarter of the other quotes I got because they've surveyed the neighboring parcels. They know what's going on around there. So right. it's for the other guys were like, I don't know, this could be 10 or 12 days of field work for us. Whereas these guys are like, oh, we know this area. It's going to be like two days of field work and then putting all the documents together. So anyways, surveyors in multiple regions, same for environmental, soil scientists, wetland consultants, multiple every region agents in every region I'm trying to think what other vendors do what are other vendors you work with i'm trying to think of like other uh people i'm forgetting um, yeah just uh sometimes we have attorneys yeah there you go we just have one really we just have one attorney in florida um yeah one real estate attorney awesome uh, for the whole state yeah very good. Oh, and one probate yeah. attorney. Actually, I'm sorry. We have two. We have a real estate attorney and then we have a probate attorney. Shout out to Al Nicoletti. I don't know if Al he Nicoletti. Is, but... yeah, yeah, I was yeah, about to yeah. say, yeah. when I think of probate, when I think yeah. of Florida, I think of Al Nicoletti. Yeah, yeah. He, he's Heck incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Love Al. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what is your favorite thing about the land business? I don't know if I could pick a favorite. So I'm just going to list a few. Yeah. I love looking yeah. at maps. I just, lo I love looking at any type of, especially topography maps. I just think they're really cool. Yeah. I just love like analyzing. I love when like a new deal comes in that everybody's excited about. And cause I don't see as many of the deals that are like, those kind of get filtered out now. Like a lot of the really junky stuff I don't really see. Um, so when I get tagged in pebble and it's, Hey, check this out. And then I can tell there's a ton of excitement. It's like that feeling is all oh, heck. Yeah. That's really cool. I love going in the field 
we had this property for a while. We had, we owned it for six months because we were doing a bunch of work on it. But it was just this beautiful property in the panhandle. It was like 160 acres. It had two spring-fed creeks flowing through it that originated on the property from Freshwater Springs. And wow. they flowed through the property. And tons of wildlife, big grandfather pine trees, volunteer pine trees. And we spent... We went up there six or seven times. We spent the whole day on that property just wandering around six or seven times, shooting guns, hanging out, driving my Tacoma around on there. Uh, nice. I don't know. That's really fun. And I just love, I love people. I love talking to people and making friends and shooting the shit. Yeah. I don't know. I, I love almost everything about the business, honestly. I don't know if there's, I don't know. There's not much that I don't like. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing. So Thinking back to when you were brand new in the land industry, if someone is brand new listening to this now, what would you say are some of the most important needle moving activities that they can do daily when they're just getting started in the land business? I don't know about now, but I know for, they probably haven't changed. I guess they're probably, maybe they're timeless, but just sending out marketing consistently answering your phone returning it's so basic right send out marketing answer your phone or return calls promptly what else i don't know those are that to me those are yeah. like the biggest things right yes yeah. it's, it's a marketing business right you yeah. have to get leads and so do marketing <laughs> yeah <laughs> pretty simple yeah yeah i don't know i do i tell i i do calls with people that are newer occasionally. And I do think, I don't know what to say. When people say oh, I've sent out 10 or 15,000 mailers and I haven't gotten any deals. I don't know what to say to that. It's like, it hurt. I, I feel bad when I hear that. Right. So right. I don't know what the, it's hard to tell somebody like to keep, keep at it when you've been <laughs> like, maybe you only had 10 grand to start this yeah. business. It's all, oh, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, and that's the land business too. It's their variables that you just can't control. And that yeah. same person, if they keep mailing, they may get three deals the next month. It's just yeah, how it happens. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question of, for you personally, what do you find to be some of the biggest challenges in the land industry? Question. Man, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what our specific challenges are right now. You might not have any, which is yeah. not a good thing either. I yeah. mean, just, you're optimizing and you're scaling and you're doing the things. I, I do think for us, I think one thing that comes to mind is finding good title companies in new areas. Yeah, that's a big I think, one. I think that can be quite a challenge. Sometimes we have to try a lot of them before, before we find one that sticks in a new, like in a new state. We're good in Florida, but in new areas, it's just even, I don't know if you've done deals in Georgia, but like one of the things I'm learning in Georgia is that like a lot of the closing attorneys we talk to, it's like they only do closings. Like they'll go outside of their radius, but they'll tell you we're going to charge a lot more if we have to go outside of like these five or six counties. Because a lot of the title searches, again, this is just my understanding of it. We're still pretty new there, but Title searches actually happen at the courthouse. They don't, it's not like wow. Florida or California or something where everything is really clean and online and easily accessible. It's like a lot of these title searches, you have to actually go to the courthouse or the recorder's office and wow. do the search. So it's like in Georgia for us, it's not like we just have, we can just have one title company to cover the whole state, although we're trying to find that option it seems like maybe the best option is going to be having like multiple for different regions. I don't know. I could be right. If somebody markets Georgia a lot and wants to tell me otherwise, hit me up. But yeah, uh... definitely. <laughs> Man, that sounds like a process going to the courthouse just to do a title search. That's talk about bottleneck, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, yeah. in your opinion, what's something that very few people or no one is really talking about in the land industry that we should be talking about right now? I don't know, man. <laughs> trying to think something we should all good. Yeah. Something we should be talking about. I don't know. I think a lot of this just comes down to basics. It's not yeah. that it's not that complicated. I don't know who somebody was talking, might have been Ajay was telling me this because we, we were just in Puerto Rico together for a week, which was awesome. 
somebody there was talking about this. I want to say it was uh, Alex Hormozzi thing. He was talking about he did all this research on like frozen yogurt businesses. And I could be getting this horribly wrong. But it was like basically to be like successful in that business, to be like profitable, you only had to be in like the top 75, like within the 75th percentile or something like that. And it was just like, it was just like very basic steps to like success. I don't know. I feel like that's how it is here. It's just stay focused. I think part of the reason I think we've been very successful. And I think a lot of it is just, we're very like focused on this. We're not like, we don't do a lot of, we just keep, we know what works. We just keep doing it. Like I keep saying, it's mark, send your marketing, answer your phone, return calls, be nice on the phone, be approachable, be trustworthy. Don't be shady. If you're going to double close, be clear. That's what you're doing. Because otherwise you're going to, and that's how we've approached it. I don't know. Sure. And just being easy to work with for vendors as well. Be someone that your vendors or your title company like wants to do business with. Yeah. It's basic stuff, right? Same for yep. funders, whatever. Be someone that funders want to fund a deal for again. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. It doesn't have to be difficult. And I, but I fall into that trap sometimes too. Of, okay. What's the next, if it seems more complicated then for some reason, it feels like that's going to work better for some yeah. reason. Cause it's, oh, there are more check boxes or more steps to do. Clearly I am being more proactive in making sure that I can't fail at something. But at the end of the day, like fundamentals are important. <laughs> There's a reason why they're fundamentals. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, what do you consider to be your superpower? No, I think I do think it's funny because I don't really do this much anymore, but I do think I'm really good on the phone with sellers. I guess I still, I do still close a lot of our like higher dollar deals. I'll drive out in person. Sometimes I might be po possibly in the next week or two, I'm going to be flying for the first time to meet a seller. She's like a nice old lady and she wants to like meet me in person. And I'm just like, I will do that because yeah. she has a really cool property that I want to buy. I don't know. I think I'm not. Yeah, just being really good with sellers. But yeah, I don't know. I don't do that as much anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I am. I do think I have like good, I guess I'm very disciplined and pretty like self-motivated. I think a lot of that, I was homeschooled. And wow. the way my mom homeschooled, homeschooled us was like, we were very much, we were, it taught a lot of like independence and like being in charge of your own learning. So I think I learned that from a young age of taking ownership and taking responsibility for your outcomes. And so I think that's really bled through to how I deal with people and how I deal with business and even just whatever. Um, actually, something I do think this isn't specifically related, related to land, but what you said about when you asked about what people should be talking about, uh, I think this is true for any business, but it's like people should be talking about taking care of their health more like their personal health i i just i meet so many entrepreneurs that it's just like they're in terrible shape like they eat like shit they don't sleep enough whatever everything this whole business it's, it's coming from your brain like if, don't you think you're going to do a better job you're going to make better decisions if you're like in a good state make sure you're right you know getting enough sleep like eating like exercising every day getting sunlight in the morning that's one of the things like callan talks about that a lot and her mastermind meetings, which I love we're, we're kindred spirits in that way, but it's I'm not saying everybody has to like get a sauna and a cold plunge like I have back here or whatever, but it's like just taking care of your body because yeah. your body and your mind are connected and you can't just burn it at both ends forever and not take care of yourself and eat McDonald's every night. I don't That's know. a big I think, one. I think people should be focused on that. Yeah, definitely. That's really good. So what's your definition of success? Oh man, you're hitting me with some tough questions. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. No, I like it. You guys are, for me, it's, it just feels successful that I don't have to like leave home for six weeks at a time to make a living anymore. I don't know. I was in Puerto Rico for a week with, it was like Ajay and Dave Denniston and Buck and Drew Haney and all the Peter. And I felt really successful there because it was just like, man, this is so cool. Like this, I get to do, I'm on a work trip right now and I'm like staying on the beach in Puerto Rico. This is great. Yeah. Um, I love it. I love that. I, know. I just, I feel, I feel successful because I have an office in my backyard that I get to work out. of. It's just I don't know, little things being, being able to have like ownership and autonomy over my schedule and my life. 
that's huge. That's yeah. for me, at least for me, that's huge. Like I like yeah. the whole freedom and independence piece and doing what you want to do when you want to do it with the people that you want to do it with. I know that's super cliche, but yeah, there's a reason why it's cliche because it's, it's true. So yeah. love that. Who are some of your favorite entrepreneurs, business leaders, thought leaders that, that you like to read, follow that kind of thing? Lately, I've been going deep on the Peter Nukasani turned me on to this, but the guys, David Heinemeyer, Hansen, and I'm going blank on the other guy's name, but the guys from 37 Signals and Basecamp, mm. they wrote this book called Rework that I just read, and that was really good. And I've been watching their podcast a lot on YouTube. So I've been nerding out on them lately. Cal Newport. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrote Deep Work. Yeah, I love him. I've listened to or read that book probably five or six times in the last two or three years. I love that one. David Allen, getting things done. I'm a huge fan of him and like all things GTD. Yeah, that's a good one. Those would be some top ones. What's his name? Strategic coach guy, Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy and their books. I love the gap in the gain. Amazing. Who not how amazing. I haven't listened to the new one yet, but I'm sure it's great. Yeah, those are what I've been. And then, of course, traction, like all things like traction EOS. I've, that's I'm reading those right now. Yeah, uh, as well. Uh, Love that. Oh, I'm reading this book right now called The Art of Power. Oh, I, I don't, okay. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Tig Nhat Han. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it. It's Vietnamese, but uh, Cheyenne bought that for me for my birthday. And that's been that is a really impactful book. Just on he talks about like mindset and meditation and i think he's like a he was like a buddhist monk mm. i have to read that and i'll read like two pages at a time because it's like a lot to process a lot yeah uh, some of that's it goes great. over my head but yeah yeah that's awesome that's really good there's a few of those i haven't heard of before so i'll definitely check those out especially yeah. that power yeah uh, so what's your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life I, my wife and I were just talking about, I'd say like in the next, we have a lot of goals and dreams, but I'd say in within the next three years, we have our sights set on a particular house in a, it's actually like a very specific, it's, we have our sights set on one house that I really want to buy in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. It's not even for sale. It's a long story, but that is like a very specific dream that we have to buy that house and move into it. It's just, it's this amazing house on the water and it's close to my parents and my little brothers and a lot of my uh, friends and stuff. But now I'm just real focused on, I guess some of my specific goals are, shoot, I want to be able to do 25 pause rep pull-ups by the end of the year. I have a lot of specific goals for growing the business over the next three years in terms of like revenue and where I'm going to be. Other than being in the next, within three years, I'm fully in a more CEO visionary role and out mm. of more of the day-to-day -day stuff. I have a lot of, yeah, I, guess, I don't know. I have too many to list, honestly, like <laughs> personal, all... like fitness goals and health yeah. goals and goals for my wife and I's relationship, travel. A lot of them I'm doing. It's, I have certain, one of the things, actually, when you asked, I thought of it after the question about being successful, but I have this group of friends that I go camping with three or four times a year. And that was like a goal for a while. And now it's just, I just do it. So it's almost like this goal that remains like an area of focus. Okay. Am I making sure I'm like doing this? And it's, we've done all our camping trips this season. And to me, that feels like success when it's like, I do the things that I need to do so that I can go camping and just chill out in the woods for two or three days and not worry about, am I forgetting something do I need to be checking my email while I'm out here or whatever that that yeah. feels like success and that's something I'm already doing but that's I want to keep doing that I want to do more of that more of that yeah, yeah that's so cool and I love the goals just allow you to be so much more intentional with like your life and how you're spending your time because if you're not like life is going to happen anyway and so it might yeah. as well be something that that you want it to be that that you design and that you can engineer man the Doing L10 meetings every week for now, we've been at it like six weeks and having, we did our first like annual quarterly with like everybody came to stay, came to like my house in Tampa. And we did like, we set up like screen, like look, the way I'm talking to you now. And we, we had, cause our EOS guy, he's, he, he didn't come in, but so he was virtual, but setting those goals and then setting the rocks and then doing the L10s and having the, it's, it's, 
incredible the power of just as a, an example i have a to-do for one of my rocks for my only rock i had a to-do that was it was due this yesterday morning and tuesday night I'm like done with work for the day. And I'm like, oh crap, I haven't done my, I haven't done that. So it's back to work for an hour or whatever. And got it done. Cause I was like, I'm Love not that. showing up. I'm not showing up to the L10 tomorrow <laughs> with everybody being like, oh yeah, guys, I went camping all weekend. And then I just totally fucked off on getting my to-do my one thing that I was supposed to do before this meeting done. I'm not going to say that. Right. Are you kidding me? So it's, I'm going to get <laughs> it done. And I think having that, I'm just loving the accountability and just having more, honestly, a lot of our goals. Uh, my personal goals and goals for the business could probably use a lot more specificity in the way they're in the language. And that's something we're working. We're getting better at setting more like specific and measurable goals. But having that sort of it, it feels like we're move, we're all moving in the same ish direction now. Or as before, it was we were doing good. It's like we're doing deals. We're sending marketing. The day to day is happening. But it's OK. What's next, though? Let's. How are we going to improve? And now right. it feels like we're, it feels like every week we're like making these little incremental improve. It feels like we're getting like, you know, half a percent or 1% better like every week. And I can just feel that and see that how that's going to compound over the next one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 years. Yeah. Where that's going to yeah. put us. And that's, that is really exciting. Like I have been, since we started the EOS, I swear like my energy level and I know it's not, there's other systems that you could do, but it's just setting goals, setting metrics. Like my energy levels have been higher. It's just, I wake up like, I got to go. I got shit to do for my rock. Let's go. I'm not like puttering around like, oh, what do I need to work on today? I don't know. Super powerful. Yeah. yeah. Super powerful. Yeah. I think that one of the things that we've all heard is like founders and CEOs of the businesses that we start is you always want to get to the point where you can work on your business instead of in your business. We hear that yeah. constantly. Oh yeah. And I love about EOS is it just gives you a framework to be able to, to better do that. So mm -hmm. like when I first started implementing EOS in my business and I, it forced me to think about the ultimate vision and what the plan was and how we're going to grow and share that with my team. It actually felt like now we're doing, like now I have a business. Like before yeah. we, were, we were doing stuff, but like now it feels, oh, yes. we have a map. So yes. does it feel like that for you a little bit? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Love yeah. it. Very good. Josiah, I want to thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time and sharing your experience. Uh, this has been a really cool conversation. Is there anything that you're looking for right now in terms of connections or resources? Like how can our community give back to you? What what are you looking for right now? Um, Man, we're looking for more subdivide deals, especially in Florida, in ru rural Florida. So if anybody has anything like that they want to partner on, or even if you're just looking for an assignment fee or whatever, we're looking to fund more deals too. I don't know. It, yeah. I don't know. I, I should have thought about that more. I knew you were going to ask that. I should have thought about that more. <laughs> That's um, all right. Yeah. Someone does have a, a potential deal that they'd like for you to take a look at to possibly fund, or maybe yeah. they found like maybe a subdivide deal. How, to, how can they get in touch with you? How can they communicate with you? Uh, you can hit me at Josiah at acrevault.com. Excellent. Yeah. And we'll have that in the show notes, Josiah yeah. at anchorvault.com. Yeah. Josiah, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Steve, thanks for joining us. Armand, Jay, Horace, Sarah, all of the rest of the people that are uh, live streaming. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with a brand new interview, brand new guest. If you want to continue the conversation, please do that on onlylandfans.com. We would love to continue the conversation and connect there as well. Until then, be safe, take care, and we'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they built and run their businesses, then check out my group Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.